performance. Actually, I can say two of them now because he's running Performance Studies International this year. Um, so bring all your questions and thoughts about um, that aspect of curating, performance programming, mm -hmm. performance making. He deals with a lot of um, performance people, not just performance art, but also the, the kind of higher art realms, such as opera. He is the head of the Croatian National Opera House. So if you have questions about that kind of job, I mean, anything you want to bring to the seminar or to the talk, um, please do so. And if you might think of, I don't know if you're doing this in the seminar, but you might think of going on um, Performance Studies International and taking a look at uh, Fluid States, which is the 2015 um, series of events that he uh, really masterminded. And instead of doing a single national conference, which was the kind of standard thing, and which he did one year in Zagreb, which was very successful, um, he and a group of people basically organized the events to take place all over the world once a month. And so I organized an event in Montreal, which is why I was there, what, what was that, like a month ago? Um, but it's really cool. So go online and look at Fluid States before he comes. Um, and then after that, we have Cara Keeling, who is USC's own. She's a professor in uh, American Studies and Ethnicity. Really, really interesting um, cultural studies, deals with race and gender, and that would be really cool as well. So without further ado, I will let Hannah introduce our guest. I'm gonna read off my, it's okay. Is it okay to be over here? Okay. In Gary, Indiana's A Significant Loss of Human Life, semiotexts about the author reads, hailed by the Guardian as one of the most important chroniclers of modern psyche, Gary Indiana is the author of the darkly satirical trilogy set in Southern California during the late 1990s. Resentment, Depraved Indifference, and Three Month Fever. Uh, he's also the author of two collections of essays, Utopia's Debris and Let It Bleed. Gary Indiana is a novelist, playwright, theater director, actor, and visual artist who has been making work since the late 1970s. In March of this year, Sarah Cowan of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in an article in the Paris Review titled Too Complicated for Human Brains, describes Indiana's work as too personal and cryptic to be documentary, though it keeps a watchful distance. She writes that it's the kind of work that doesn't remind you of anyone in particular because it reminds you of everyone. His critiques of entrenched power structures and societal prejudice are consistently present in his body of work. Gary Indiana is a prolific writer, critic, and visual artist, contributing to numerous publications as the chief art critic for The Village Voice until 1987, a contributing artist in the 2014 Whitney Biennial, where he displayed his work to Stanley Park, an LED curtain containing video footage, in which Indiana replaces the eye of a surveillance tower at the Presidio Modelo in Cuba with a video of jellyfish and photographs of nude young men, suggesting, as described in a synopsis provided by the Whitney Museum, an analogy between recent jellyfish population increases in the majority of the world's coastal ecosystems and rising global incarceration rates, particularly of men of color and rampant government surveillance. Indiana's penetrating criticality, unrelenting wit, and satirical prowess manifest in his explorations of sexuality, violence, economy, media, and post-modernity, as he articulates his experiences both directly and indirectly in his writing, which while largely out of print until recently, his trilogy being re-released by semiotext and installments has researched as Indiana's practice once more changes shape and takes on new life. While he joked recently at 356 South Mission that he's not used to being honored, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the wildly influential and notably accomplished Gary Indiana. Yeah, it's true. I'm not used to um, um, having quite so much attention put on me as has been happening recently. It's all good. I, I love it, but it's it's weird. You know, just <laughs> weird. Um, like I, because I think that 
you get used to a certain kind of abjection over a period of decades and it becomes sort of your comfort zone almost and then when that's taken away from you you have to adjust to this other thing that's really hard to get your head around and that's like acceptance or <clears throat> whatever but hey I'll take it it's good um, the um, the the piece in the Whitney is was kind I mean the piece in the Whitney is uh, kind of a summation it was kind of a summation of a lot of preoccupations that I had over over a number of years and then also um, discovering these structures. Uh, on the Isla de la Juventud in Cuba of um, these, uh, these five prison buildings that uh, were constructed during the Moncado dictatorship in the 20s. Um, so there were five, uh, five buildings that were built very much according to the, uh, the schematic of Jeremy Bentham of the Panopticon, and they um, were used for political prisoners from 1929 right up until 1967. Um, Fidel and Che Guevara used them for their political prisoners, but they had also been incarcerated there as political prisoners when they first, the first attempt at the revolution when they came from Mexico. And actually, on the Isla de la Juventud, the boat that they came that time in is there uh, in the town. And there was something very odd that you would see in the film. I'm not going to show it now because I think you've all seen it or something. But anyway, um, the, in, the, in the town, which is the only town really in uh, this is the main town, Nueva Girona, uh, in the middle of the park, near the um, museum, not the museum of the prison, but the museum of the, of the island, which was a pirate island. It was the, uh, the buccaneers and the, um, the pirates of the Spanish um, fleet that worked, you know, they, they were um, freebooters and people that were hired by Queen of England or the King of Spain, you know, to do these nefarious things. They used these coves at the, at the bottom of the island that were infested with crocodiles to hide their booty. And uh, the local thing is always that somebody that you will meet there always tells you about somebody who was digging an artesian well and struck this chest full of gold or found this gold. And they do find gold all over the island, but anyway, in the middle of the town, that uh, you maybe remember or see in, the, in, the, in that video, there's this enormous bird cage. I mean, it's like, it, it's as big as a house, and it's built just like the prison. It's round, and it's, it looks just like one of the prison buildings. Um, I thought that was something very interesting, because it was, why would you have like four parrots in a bird cage the size of this room? I mean, you know, like four little parrots just... <laughs> but anyway, um, the, um, the, the thing about the... Of course, now we don't need a panopticon. I mean, now they don't, or the powers that be don't need a panopticon. They can, they can see everything we do very easily and very disconcertingly, I think uh, I think yesterday I was, um, you know, like I have one of these stupid phones that when you plug it into your computer, it reproduces all this stuff, puts all this information on your phone, like if there's one single email address in there somewhere, one phone number, it makes a new contact, and when you go through contacts, it like takes three days to run through them after a while, and then when I shut the phone off, the, when I turned the phone on again, there was an email from a company that helps you sort out your contacts on your phone. <laughs> like instantly, I do, it's this thing. Um, okay, I just managed to 
<laughs> it just seems to have managed to have not, wait a minute, I know. Okay, this one. Um, I thought maybe we could, just to, um, does this come up on the, yeah, there? Yeah, let me just I, I thought sure. maybe if we could just have five minutes of contemplation. Uh, I'll just show you, the, the, this is one of a series of things that are obviously derived from the Warhol screen test. Uh, I'm remaking them, let's say. Um, but, but uh, okay, and so we we'll just start with that. Okay. Yeah. Gary, you want the chair back yeah, there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Oops. Here you go. Oh, <laughs> oh you put the chair back there? I <laughs> thought it was going to sit could, down there. Whatever. You could do both. You could do both All right. in case. You have here, one there, whatever you want. Oh, my God. This is lethal. This thing. Oh. There, you could sit wherever you want.
No, um, we can do that in a minute. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, the lights? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, um, the, um, I was just got very interested in the sort of event quality of these little, you know, very minor sort of changes in people's faces when you just hold the camera on them that long. We're not used to looking at people for that long, particularly not into their eyes. It's, um, I mean, it's not. Uh, original with me, but I kind of like the way I'm doing it better than the way Warhol did it. But <laughs> that's just you know, because I like color instead of black and white. But um, you know, I mean, I, I like my I like my subjects better than his, but that's because because uh, I'm doing them now instead of then. But um, yeah, the. Um, I didn't prepare like a talk or a lecture. I just, uh, I, I mean, I should have. I just didn't think about it very much. I just um, thought I would wing it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Um, I mean, I could talk about the the show or the the that. Um, it's weird to, you know, it's like a weird thing in this. I'm not saying it's particular to this country because it's actually pretty widespread that you're supposed to do one thing in your life. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're Britney Spears, you're supposed to do that. If you're Jonathan Franzen, you're supposed to do that. If you're this, that, you know, like you're supposed to do one thing. I don't do just one thing. I do a lot of different things. Mostly have been known as a writer because um, I didn't, care to show any of this work for 30 years. I mean, I, um, I had a big show. Well, you know what? This is really bad luck to talk about, but I had a big show in New York in 2002, and then the gallery director died immediately afterwards. Um, I was supposed to do a show here with Giovanni from China mm -hmm. Art Objects, and he came to New York, and we were going to talk about it, and then he died. Um, I'm now represented by a gallery in New York where the owner has cancer um, and has sort of stepped away from... See, I feel like I'm, I, I, I'm hoping I, I'm not bringing bad luck with me everywhere. But, <laughs> but um, you know, after the show that I did with Colin Delan and after he died, a lot of people came around that wanted to represent me, but they all said, well, how do you want to, um, I forget what, um, what do you want to do with this work? Or like, what do you, how do you want to, basically, how do you want to sell this work, you know? And I just didn't, like, I didn't want to have a marketing plan. I didn't, I just wanted to show the work and nobody seemed to want to just show the work. They wanted to know how they could prune it or, you know, present it in such a way as to make it the most marketable. I totally understand that that's what people in the business of showing art want to do, but it seemed to me that at least in New York among the dealers, I was talking to for a long time, it seemed to be their exclusive focus was how to monetize this kind of like weirdly, um, you know, eclectic stuff. And so I didn't show anything again until, um, I mean, except to put things in auctions and, you know, charity stuff for like 10 years. So now, I, I mean, I had the sh a show in New York in 2013, a participant, and then a show this year at Envo at Envoy Gallery. That's and then now this show here, and I'm happy about it. But 
you know, I could have been showing stuff all along, I just didn't want to. And it's, you know, that's probably a luxury that a lot of people wouldn't have, but I just, you know, as I did have it, that's what I did. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not sorry either because, um, you know, we're all gonna die. I mean, it doesn't matter to me if, uh, you know, it really doesn't. It doesn't matter to me if, if, you know, if I'm anybody's image of perfection. It just doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'd probably, I'm probably kind of, what, do you have a question? I do have a question about the screen test. Yeah. <laughs> It seemed like there was this moment where he um, relaxes, and there's something that transforms in him, in him, and I feel like I looked down, and one mood was going on, and I looked back up, and I was looking at a different person, mm -hmm. like I had more access to him, uh -huh. like he changed along the way, and I was wondering um, if that was the case, if you saw that often in him. Well. I mean, it's really interesting that everybody sees something going on inside of a person without knowing what it is in this situation. I mean, I don't really know what was going on in, in Oliver's head at the time, or, uh, you know, I quite often just walk away from the camera because I don't want people to be, uh, like, too conscious of me, but um, I think that five minutes is a very long time, and people, you know, we don't think of it as a long time, but if you have a camera on you for five minutes, it's a long time, and probably undoubtedly, you know, after two minutes, let's say, you get a little bit more relaxed with the situation, or a little more you know, able to go with it, or more tense. I mean, I, I shot a really extraordinary one the other day with somebody whose face did not move. I mean, it was, it was I, this is the only time I ever saw this, and he's a very beautiful young guy who um, has a very interesting face, because he's like, um, I think, a mixture of French and Vietnamese or something, I, Asian, South Asian, and very interesting like bone structure and kind of perfect, you know, perfect, um, I mean his head is, is sort of perfectly shaped. And he, he didn't move. I mean he, I, he looked directly in the camera and he didn't move. I, he may have blinked a couple of times, but there was otherwise no other movement. And I was, I mean it was amazing. Um, because at a certain point I thought, did I have, like, did I just, like, take a still photo and think <laughs> I had a video going? Um, but then, I mean, everybody does something a little different. I mean, the, there's a, there's a, um, there's, there's one in the, in the show at, at, um, at the gallery, the, the guy just chewed gum through the whole thing. And I mean, it, it's the only part of it that was m his mouth moving, and it was sort of wonderful. I mean, it just it made you really notice everything about like because the few moments where he would stop chewing this gum it had this like earth-shaking quality. Of, I don't know what. Um, and they're just like, they're, uh, but they're revelatory. I mean, in one way or another, they just are. They're, they, they, um, they just show you something that you wouldn't see otherwise in people, I think. With, with Oliver, I don't know. I mean, like, he, he's very, he, I mean, he's, he's very easygoing, and he's also, I think, you know, very obliging. He would, you know, wanted to do that. He, you know, I asked him to do it. He was perfectly willing to do it. And I don't think he was particularly nervous about being on camera, but it may have been disconcerting to suddenly realize, oh, I can't move for five minutes. Um, you know, <laughs> that might have been in, in operating there. Um, 
because you think five minutes is just going to go, you know, and then suddenly it's interminable because the, 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 it just goes on and on and on and they can't, you know, break character or whatever because they, you have to stay in the frame. Um, Did you offer them any direction, any particular direction? Um, generally, no. If, if people, I just say, you know, just make sure you don't go out of frame. I mean, you, you know, the, if somebody asks if they should look in the camera, I just say, you know, not necessarily. You do what you want to do, you know. Um, you know, with, I mean, obviously within reason. I mean, if somebody was, I don't know, mugging or whatever, I would probably stop it, you know, but... Um, but I mean the the um, it's like sitting for a still photo, but sitting for a really really long time. And I think like in some of them you can see that the the person is um, you know really lost in his private thoughts and wanting maybe to do something else or to leave the room or you know there's there's a kind of um, or, or just really uh, not even thinking about the fact that the camera is there. There's one like that where the, it just, yeah, the guy seems actually unaware of the fact that he's <laughs> being filmed, although he's, I mean, he obviously knows it, but he just is not somewhere else in his head. Um, but um, <clears throat> anyway, I mean, that's one type of thing that's, that's in the show. I, I think a lot of people here have already seen the show, so I don't probably need to explain what's in it. But um, uh, this is a, this is this is um, one of a series of, of, of videos that I've been doing for the past few years. That are uh, Stanley Park is an, is is one of is one of them. It's um, the, I mean I started to do these back in two thousand. I think was soap. Soap was uh, a little more structured in a way than than some of these later ones because I had a um, particular idea of how to make a uh, how to how to how to make something that was connected that was not necessarily a narrative. I mean, that was not a, a linear narrative um, where. Actually, it was just blo associative blocks of, of uh, you know, just scenes, just scenes that were not necessarily. I mean, soap was connected by soap. I mean, it was, you know, I told people, I asked people to just, you know, tell me something about your relationship to soap or something interesting that you, some interesting experience you've had with soap, um, or how you feel about soap, because it, you know, it was an object that everyone has some connection to. I mean, that everybody knows and uses. So, and then all these other, all these strange things came out. You know, like one person talked about buying a bar of fake soap from a Holocaust museum that was used in the in the death camp, mm -hmm. um, and somebody else talked about. Oh, um, you know, being gi given a gift of soap by by a friend who who since died, and um, so people got into like very complicated things, things that you know were sometimes emotionally very powerful for them, and sometimes just very frivolous and funny. But um, but it was an interesting experiment, at least, because um, you know I'm. As somebody that writes novels, once in a while anyway, um, I, you know, I, I really kind of hate narrative. I kind of hate stories. I've had so many of them in my head over and read them all the time. I mean, I love them, but I hate them also. I hate the, uh, that you have to construct something that, you know, conforms to some idea of what a story is. Because to me, a story could be anything. It could be... I mean, I just I just read this. I'm gonna make a movie of this thing, this book. Um, there's a there's a what is it called? It's, I really am going to try to film this. It's like a 
It's a novella by, by, by uh, Juan Carlos Onetti called Goodbyes. And I was just reading it, uh, and I suddenly realized, oh God, this, I, could, I could make a real narrative movie out of this, because it, it's all little, everything's sort of small. You know, everything's like sort of like a glance or, or, or a, um, it's just this minute by minute story about, um, uh, I mean, you can, I can see it. Nothing very dramatic happens in this at all. It's almost like, it's almost like someone observing other people who are not doing anything particularly important or charged, but that he can see all these things in them or about them just from these small gestures and the way that they, uh, the way that they cross the street or the way that they, there's a man that comes into town to mail letters because he doesn't want to mail them from where he lives. He wants to come in and mail them from the post office and so that the neighbors don't see that he, and he pick up, picks his mail up in town so that the neighbors don't see that he's getting these letters. And it's, I mean, but it's all just very small details like this that I think, you know, could become a very interesting, you know what movie I, I'm thinking of specifically is The Heiress you know, with Olivia de Havilland and Montgomery Cliff, the, the William Wyler film, which could be a silent film. It doesn't even need any dialogue, you know, because it's all done with light and shadow. The whole story is told by, in, in light and shadow. I mean, yeah, there's a script and there's dialogue and there's all this action, but I mean, it's like, but, but you don't really need words to explain it. I think that one of the things that I felt was, um, important to me in uh, the, that I kind of got from Werner Schroeder was the sense of the silent cinema as being um, somehow better than movies that we have now because you could tell the story almost in pictograph. You could tell a story without telling a story. I mean, you, it, there was a story, but you didn't have to spell it out. You could, I mean, the, the, in the silent cinema, everything was done with a glance or a look or with light and shade and, and, not, and not this um, beetling kind of prosaic middle class, you know, kind of expository way of, 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 of telling. Um, I, I don't, uh, and, and anyway, to go back to this, I, th these were a series of things that um, uh, were to get at something, I wanted to get at something without connecting. I just wanted to put certain things together and evoke a kind of feeling, a kind of narrative, uh, not a narrative exactly, but a kind of associative building of, 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 um, of something. I mean, it's not the same as, it doesn't work the same way as Stanley Park does because I think Stanley Park is kind of like very, finally very operatic and is very, um, it's, it's more, much more emotionally charged than this one. Um, which Can I is, ask a question about soap? Yeah. Because um, uh, you mentioned also, goodbyes. How are you working with pre-existent texts? Is isn't soap from Francis Ponge? Well, in soap, I have an actress um, reading from soap, and Walter Stedding also reads from soap. I read from soap off camera um, from the Ponge text. Um, the um, you know, I, I mean, it wasn't the, the I mean, the, 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 the film wasn't illustrative of the text, but the text um, kind of enhanced the, I mean, in some ways enhanced the absurdity of the whole thing, you know, by, by um, 
by restating the theme of soap in a way that like was very insistent and 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 kind of ridiculous, you know. But it's not actually. I don't think that ridiculous. But it's well. I mean, it is kind of ridiculous. I mean, c because compared to a normal thing where you'd be telling a, a co you know like a linear story, it, it, I mean, it's it's a, it's almost a joke. But um, the so Ponge sort of figured into it. Uh, I used I used Ponge to to kind of prop up the whole thing a little bit, um, to, or to to give it some. I wanted the, them to be connected. I wanted I loved that book very much, and I wanted them to be connected. Um, I mean, I couldn't make a movie of so, but that but there you know part of that book is kind of a radio play. You could have I mean you could. You could make a movie out of it, I guess. I, I mean, it's kind of it would be kind of weird, but um, the um, yeah. well, it's interesting because it's also about the dis the dissolution of the object soap because you soap and it bubbles and then eventually at the end of the book the soap has been used up. But that is a narrative format of the bubble that is associated to other bubbles without any kind of oh yeah yeah narrative absolutely. Structure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I had thought about making a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Soap the sequel? Soap <laughs> 2. Um, the, no, because I shot a lot of stuff after I finished it that I would have liked to have included in it, but because it was not, it, I mean, it was an old, old-timey video format, and I didn't want to work in that format anymore, and I didn't want to keep you know, working on something that was in that format, so I just mm -hmm. kind of left the stuff. I mean, we got some interesting stuff, but, um, you know, I mean, also, I have to say, it's sort of crudely done, the whole thing, so I didn't want to, you know, <laughs> I just, I wanted to move on to be a little bit more polished, but this isn't actually that much more polished than so. Um, but I'll show you this, this is like the, um, is that the right size? It's the right size, right? Mm -hmm. Can turn up maybe the lights and I'll just run this. It's, I don't know how long this is, but anyway, this is... Um, there, there's another... There's another one that, was, that I was hoping to get done in the show, but I, for the show, but um, I couldn't finish it in time. It was it, uh, much more... It's about work, um, and I'll show that sometime, I hope, out here. It's people talking about their jobs or what they've done for a living, and it's kind of interesting. I have a, a whole slew of people who do really different things from one another just talking about work. Um, but this is kind of not about anything except a kind of mental trip.
I'd like to write a novel that doesn't have any characters in it. <laughs> I think would be fun. I <laughs> that's like I, I think there's there's too much narrative in the world. There's too many stories. We have to get rid of these <laughs> terrible stories that enchain us. Um, So uh, actually, I think that's it. That's the that's my tip top my presentation. If you want to ask me anything, feel free. What was the context for that poem and the song? Was there a particular of what? What was the context for it? Was there you, it was in Istanbul? Oh, well, that actually was shot all over the place. Okay. The last thing was in Dublin and the, oh. um, Malta, uh, yeah, the Spain, South of Spain. It was actually shot all over the place. Okay. That's the other nice thing about not writing a novel. I mean, <laughs> or not making a, you know, a, like a narrative thing because you can, you can just move all over the place. You just put scenes from yeah. wherever. Um, how do you generally show that? Do you screen that in kind of artist film context? Well, yeah, in, you know, in gallery. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, I, I mean, I'm not going to put it like, in, I mean, I don't know. I could send it to, I, if it was 10 minutes longer, I could put it in the film festival. But um, Barbe Schroeder was reproaching me for, not too long ago, he said, everything that you do, it comes out to either 48 minutes or 39 minutes. Why don't you do something this 120 minutes so you have a feature? Um, because, yeah, I mean, I just somehow, they dictate their own, you know, thing. Oh, yeah, the, the, the tilted, the tilted, um, the, the shot where the, there's a superimposition of a train going by in the tilted yeah. kind of thing. That's the Francis Bacon studio in Dublin, the doorway of the Francis yeah. Bacon studio, um, where they've recreated piece of lint by piece of lint, yeah. the entire Francis Bacon studio is quite an amazing, amazing thing. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I, you know what, I mean, it kind of grew out of this other thing. The, this kind of came out of this other thing that I was trying to, to, to prepare. It was like, um, I had shot all this stuff in Bulgaria, and especially this, these old propaganda films, these old Bulgarian communist propaganda films, but it was in a, a you know, the Museum of Socialism in Sofia, and the mo they were showing them on monitors kind of high in the wall and I had to like shoot it, you know, with a camera at an angle, just, you know, like try to, and then when I realized I wanted to use this for something, I had to reframe everything, like in, 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 in you know, like every 
and I, you know, I don't have, obviously don't have a very steady hand. I mean, anyway, but so mm -hmm. I had to, I had to reframe frame by frame by frame mm -hmm. these old propaganda films. And then um, by the time I got through that, it had taken a month already to do like a, like, like a, a five, a three minute sequence, five minute sequence, I think, because it was, it, that took a, a month to just get it so that it wasn't all over the place. And then, uh, so I just went ahead and took all the outtakes and put them, <laughs> put them here instead of finishing the thing. I'm going to finish it at some point. But it was, um, yeah, there was, there was that. There was this Maltese marching band. Um, I, I f forget what the point of that one was going to be. I, there was a specific, I mean, I had a really pointed idea with it, too. It was going to go from the, the dark gray, grainy communist past to the kind of overlit, bright, sleek, technological uh, appearance of this marching band in Malta that were, uh, um, and uh, I forget what else, I, I mean it's similar in a timeline, I don't know where I put it, but, um, but I, I <laughs> it didn't happen yet, so this, I, I did this instead, that one instead. Um, the, uh, and then there's this one of work. I have a, like a, a restore, somebody restored uh, the, all the Tiffany, Louis Tiffany windows in, in this church in Manhattan and somebody worked in a, in a, in a magazine warehouse at one point. Um, oh gosh. Uh, I'm forgetting because things just go in my head. I have like four or five different really interesting people and then some more lined up, but uh, I haven't finished that one yet. It's going to be about work, just um, what people do, what people do, <laughs> work. Um, Can I ask you some questions? Yeah, if you want. <laughs> or have some part of the conversation. Um, well, I guess I have two minds right now. One is thinking about this way that you're working with, um, you know, kind of an anti-narrative or like refusal of narrative place, and how how people, how your viewer, how I at least engage, which is this kind of way of always inserting, inserting, inserting these various stories and trying to sort of figure out how this is coming together until I just finally give up, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> mentally, and I kind of just start finally letting the stuff wash, just kind of wash over me in different ways, well, you know. I mean, somebody that I, um, you know, that I, somebody's work I've been very affected by, Chantelle Ackerman, who, yeah. you know, actually we collaborated at one point to, we were trying to make a film together about 20 years ago in Paris. It didn't quite, ha it didn't happen, but we had a lot of, she was a good friend of mine. We, we had a lot of discussions about it. The, yeah. the, the, the idea of just the stare, I mean, the, the idea of just holding a shot on something mm -hmm. until, you know, the, it begins to break down. I mean, what you're looking at begins to dissolve in a certain way, um, which, you know, for the screen test, the same idea. I like this idea of just finding a beautiful image you know, and just holding it and mm -hmm. and holding it for as long as, as you know, I can stand it. Um, and uh, in terms of connecting, I mean, that, like the sound was terrible on this here, but I mean, the sound is much better in the gallery, but um, the, uh, you know, put music on it, I mean, partly for pu just punctuation, but, um, the uh, you know the the specific things like some of these I mean a lot of these things have very private meanings for me like some of these days the Sophie Tucker song that's if you've read La Nose of Sart you know that's the song that Rokenton is hearing over and over the you know uh, in the upstairs in the you know some of these days you'll miss me honey that's fr from Sart that's from La Nose and um, 
that's the only reason it's in there. It's not because I miss my boyfriend in Cuba or anything like that. It's just, you know, it's just, um, I, I thought, you know, and, and a, lot of the, a lot of what's in Stanley Park is also very private, sort of almost, almost private uh, in terms of, you know, personal meanings for me. I mean, I'm not trying to, I, of course, you use music to, to manipulate people, clearly. I mean, you know, and, and, and so, um, you know, and to, and to sort of deter, sort of, sort of manipulate how people see the image, but, um, but in a certain way, even though, I mean, it can vary for me, like from one thing to another. I don't, um, I you know, I don't have any emotional connection to that Evan James song. I just I thought it was funny to put you know stormy weather on this. Thing because all I wanted to see was these drizzly. I mean, I just fell in love with the way that this, you know, like the idea of you're looking at a, you're looking through a, wi a wet window, okay. the with rain dripping off it, and for a long time, it's mm -hmm. kind of, the, you know, I love the, I love the patterns that it makes and everything, and, mm -hmm. and I thought, okay, well, I'll just put stormy weather, and just okay. you know, it's just kind of, um, kind of a goof, you know. Uh -huh. Uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a great cinematographer. I'm not a great photographer. I'm a, I, but I, I think I do. I, I'm a good image maker. I think I, I can, I can say that. I, because I, I, that's what I do. That's whether it's in writing or, or whatever, I can, I can do that. It's like, that's what I like to do is, um, you know, I don't mind the camera shakes. I mean, I can get a steady cam. I don't, you know, I mean, I, I, but I, I, I like the amateurismus, as Werner would say, the amateurismus, <laughs> that element of it, I like. I like it, like there's a, there's a video in the gallery where I, you know, I, I shot the thing straight on, and then you know I deliberately reframed it so that I was shooting with the part of the frame cut off, because I like I like it I like when people I like when people think you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun, you know, to 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 know yourself that it was deliberate, but you know people can think oh he's an asshole he doesn't even know how to. <laughs> I like that it's funny. To me. <laughs> Could you talk about that moment when the bottom, we have the view of the buildings and the sky and then there's a shape? Yeah, I, <coughs> I like to believe that somebody was being murdered in that apartment. I mean, cause I, That's what I thought was happening. Um, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like to think that something really dire was happening mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah, I mean that was in Budapest. That was a the, I rented an apartment in Budapest, and it happened to be, you know, in this sort of courtyard of this, you know, there were apartments all around this. Well, they weren't all connected. They were, but it, I mean, it wasn't all one building. But there were, but there were, that apartment that that was across from my balcony, and so. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just saw something going on. Somebody with a, like an iPad or something standing in the doorway, if you notice that yeah. light. And, um, and I just kept shooting because I thought something weird is going on in there, but I couldn't see. I mean, that's as good as I could see. I couldn't see it any, any more clearly than that. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know what was going on in there. No, I put the music on to give it a little Hitchcockian mm -hmm. tension. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in your music because I feel like you have a process and your intention. Um, do you just walk around with a camera and shoot things that are interesting to you and then like come back and put them together like in a Jonas Mikas kind of way? How does that... How, how, do you, how do you decide to edit? And how oh. Do you, huh. Or do you have a big file with all of these? Oh, I have millions shots? of. I mean, it's, it's like 
40 million hours of footage of one thing and another. I mean, I don't just walk around with a camera. In fact, I hate walking around with a camera. I hate, I hate holding a camera. I hate anybody <laughs> seeing me with a camera. Um, kind of shameful. Well, you know, the thing is that, I mean, the ideal thing for me would be to have that Harvey Keitel thing from that film with Rami Schneider where the eyeballs just film everything because then people don't see that you have a camera. I mean, the main thing with what I do is that people shouldn't know that you're doing this. I mean, you shouldn't, they shouldn't see it because, you know, obviously once somebody sees a camera, they react to it in some way. And, um, you know, as a result, I have like about four million photographs of people that I've photographed from overhead <laughs> balconies. Just like, I mean, it actually is really interesting. I mean, they look really interesting from overhead. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I really hate taking a camera out. I, I very rarely, I mean, I, I end up with a lot of stuff anyway, because like some of these things, some of those. Some of those things, obviously, I was alone. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't have to worry about anybody observing me. Um, yeah, that's what I found myself. There was a point, I, I think I got to the breaking point, um, which was actually, for me, that was actually right before then um, Stormy Weather came on. Uh -huh. you know, so it was like then suddenly like Stormy Weather actually organized things. But, you know, right before that, I found myself thinking, it was like, an, oh, like, I, he must be alone when he's filming these things. Like, and it, whether or not you were like that, I found because it's so just everything's so discreetly filmed. You know, you can. That's one of the things you feel is like that. The peop, it's like not that you're spying on people, but that the camera's presence in the scene, however, feels extremely discreet and low, like low key. Um, and and then I was thinking about like, like especially like as a writer, like and just like the way one works as a writer, you're often alone a lot, and um, and. And there's so much of what is happening is feels unrecorded because you're not with anyone who's witnessing it with you. So like somebody finds yeah, no, you. Exactly. I, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of Stanley Park actually is about being alone. I mean, it's it's uh, and this is about being alone. There's a really strong feeling. Um, the I mean, I I had when I was filming in the in the in the in the prison buildings. I, I had to do everything by my, my, my boyfriend was there, we had another person there, they wouldn't go into those structures because they were terrified, and I was terrified, but I had to do it. I mean, because the, the walkways that were crumbling, and the, the staircases were crumbling, I mean, it was really dangerous to do it, but I, I thought, okay, I have to shoot this, and I did, but nobody would go with me, but at least there were people there that if I had fallen from the top <laughs> thing, they would have, you know, would have cleaned, up your body. Would have cleaned me up, or would pick me up, scoop me up. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but a lot of, a lot of Stanley Park, which I just shot alone. I was alone somewhere. I was alone in Vancouver in Stanley Park and alone in, um, where else is that? Uh, where was that crumbling building? Hmm? Where was the crumbling building? Oh, the Presidio. No, not in this. In the, oh. in, the, in Stanley Park, the, oh. the things that were shot in the Presidio Modelo, the, the, the model prison oh, right. in Cuba. That, I mean, that was, the, those buildings were left to crumble. Yeah. I mean, they were left to the elements. They, they preserved some of the structures on the, in, the, in the complex. One is a, is a kind of museum of, um, of the place, but the the actual the actual uh, Bentham uh, structures. There are five of them. I shot in all five of them. If you see the if you see the film, it, the, a lot of people can't tell that, but the, the you can tell because the guard tower in the center is different in each one, mm -hmm. slightly different. But um, the, the 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 structures themselves were, were abandoned. Were just left to the elements. They're you know, going to eventually just collapse. And uh, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, a lot of it is about being alone. I mean, the the, the um, and loneliness and about missing someone, missing. Uh, that's. Um, that's life, I mean. Yeah. 
Uh, in terms of about this, um, the, the time it was shown in Istanbul, it's two women that are drinking, uh, that are talking at a coffee shop. Yeah. Who are, are there like who are these people? Are they actors? Or are they like from the people you ask? Like, um, how did that happen? Mm, they're just teenage girls in Istanbul having a cup of coffee. And you just asked them, can I? I didn't ask them. them. I just <laughs> shot at. You didn't ask them. Okay. No, I didn't ask them a thing. I was at the next table. I just turned the camera on. So they still won't know. No, they. I think they actually knew I was filming. I, they didn't care. I mean. Okay. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, and normally I would, you know, not do that, to tell you the truth. Her hands and, you know, are so good. Hmm? But that woman's hand. But I, no, that's exactly what it was, was that I was observing her and this language that she had with her hand, these gestures with her hands, I had to get that. I had to get it. They were so beautiful. Um, and uh, maybe she knew that, too. I don't know. But... <laughs> This motion like this that she does, it was fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, I would not normally probably do that. I, I would ask people <laughs> if it was okay or, you know, just not do it. But sometimes you have to, you have to. I mean, just even if it's a little sneaky, you have to do it. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I have a question about um, if, if you consider that you have a different tone in your image, in your film, video work, or in your different kind of writing. Um, it's very lyrical, maybe that's also the effect of the music, but there's a really strong beauty, beauty um, that's palpable in these images, and also in Stanley Park and all these. Um, what are they, jellyfish, and you know, kind of feeling of either loneliness, as we've been talking about, or kind of entrapment, or there's, there's a strong lyrical kind of quality, and I wonder if that's a different tone that you have in writing, or kind of more incisive, or more... Um, I think I tend to be more detached in my writing. I, 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 I'm, I think I tend to be a little cold compared to, I mean, I, it's easier for me to express my emotions through the images than, than words. I, I don't, I, it's just somehow easier to, 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 to engage that side of myself. I just, um, I, 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 it's hard, I, 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 I write differently than, I mean, I feel like this is sort of writing, it's a form of writing for me. Um, but I, um, but I, th I think I'm a little. I'm not so lyrical in my mm -hmm. writing. I mean, I'm pretty precise, <laughs> forensic, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so it's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a certain way, I think it's all the same thing. But um, but you're right. I mean, it's just not 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 the same tone at all. I don't think. Um, You know how they have that bad sex writing thing in The Guardian every year? The, or is it The Independent? Like the bad sex writing award? That's how I feel about lyricism and writing. It's like they should just have a bad lyricist, bad, you know. Um, it's often the same thing, kind of. Yeah, yeah kind of yeah. is the same thing. Um, it, I mean, it's so easy to go wrong with writing. I try to be very correct. I just, I mean, I try to be very exact and, and, and to, to, to not, um, to not, uh, I can just do things with a camera that I can't do with a pencil, so. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.